Hello viewers, good day. This is Dr. VK for you again. Today I am starting with the lectures on upper limb. So the first lecture will be an introductory lecture on upper limb. So the objectives of today's session will be general introductory remarks, subdivisions of upper limb, major vessels and nerves supplying the upper limb and their venous drainage and finally we are also going to look about certain aspects of the bones of the upper limb that is the osteology of the upper limb. Okay. Now coming to the upper limb as such we all have two upper limbs and we humans have upper limbs because in the lower forms it is actually called as four limbs because the lower forms use their all the four limbs for walking so that is for locomotion but due to the adoption of the erect posture in man a man become a bipedal animal so he walks with two legs because he has gained upright posture. So now what happens is his two arms are actually free. So because of that the arms are actually spared from the weight bearing function. So our upper limbs they do not involve in weight bearing. So that is why if you look at the proportion of your upper limb versus lower limb, the lower limb is more muscular, the bones are more larger, the muscle volume is more and if you look at the proportion of the lower limb, definitely it is larger than the upper limb because the lower limb is involved in weight bearing. So that is one thing. Now second thing is from the quadrupeds we have become bipedal animals. So we have gained an erect posture. Is it really a boom to us or whether it is a curse to us? So that we will discuss later in some other topic. Today we are concentrating mainly on the upper limb. So due to the erect posture we have become bipedal animals. So naturally what happens is the upper limbs are spared from weight bearing. So now the arms are free and therefore what happens is they have a great degree of mobility. So we all know how we can swing our arms, stretch our arms, naturally we can grab something from our from a distant place. So how we can reach and then take those things if you want all these things is because of the greater degree of mobility which actually our upper limb has got. Now what happens is not only because we have attained an erect posture, we also have something called as a girdle and especially this bone, the clavicle which actually acts as a strut. So the strut is what happens is what are all the forces from the upper limb are actually transmitted via this clavicle to the axial skeleton. So one very important or significant development is the clavicle in human beings. Okay. So we should understand first of all what is a girdle. A girdle is a one which connects your appendicular skeleton whether might be the upper limb or the lower limb to the main skeleton that is the axial skeleton. So in case of the upper limb it is actually called as the pectoral girdle and the lower limbs it is actually called as the pelvic girdle. So one is the pectoral girdle and other one is actually the pelvic girdle. So now we all know that what is a girdle which connects an upper an appendicular skeleton to the axial skeleton. The bones forming the pectoral girdle 
or the clavicle which you are able to see here it's also called as the collar bone and this is actually the scapula so in layman's term it is also called as the shoulder blade so clavicle and scapula constitutes the pectoral girdle scapula if you see one end through which it is articulating with the shoulder joint and another process of scapula called as the acromion it is actually articulating with the clavicle from the acromioclavicular joint so apart from that you are able to see the clavicle is simply held in its position only by the muscles so it is completely surrounded by muscles so the muscles which attach the scapula they attach to the limb as well as to the ribs and that is why the scapula is held in its position so naturally if we spare even the scapula then we are only left with the clavicle so the clavicle one joint is the acromioclavicular joint and clavicle does not make any direct connection with the appendicular skeleton sorry the scapula does not make any direct connection so naturally only the clavicle articulates here with the sternum forming the sternoclavicular joint so it is only the sternoclavicular joint is the only means of connection where the pectoral girdle is actually associated to the axial skeleton okay so mainly it is the sternoclavicular joint now how does our upper limb differ from the lower forms especially even the primates if you look the main difference i told you our upper limbs are not involved in weight bearing so naturally we can freely swing it has acquired a great degree of mobility so not only mobility it is also somewhat reduced in size so that it may be very much flexible to perform certain functions and main thing is you are able to see the thumb so this is the thumb of other primates like tarsier chimpanzee gibbon and of course even orangutan you see so here totally all the five are same here see how the thumb is very short when see the length of the other fingers and thumb but in the humans only if you look the thumb is actually separated or it is present at right angles to the other fingers almost 90 degrees to the other fingers so because of that what happens is your thumb can be opposed against the all the four fingers due to which we can perform many many actions that is why we are different from the other primates so mainly the prehensile function which is for grasping that pronation and supination can also be performed in the forearm and you have a freely movable shoulder which you have already told so you have a very freely movable shoulder pronation and supination is possible in the forearm and our fingers especially the thumb lies right angles to the other fingers it can be opposed against the other four digits and naturally this is a very important aspect of the human hand so you are able to see the opposing action so against all the other four digits the thumb can be approximated so this is very much important to perform certain or many of the skilled movements so as i told you that because of this arrangement of the your thumb and the other four digits and the opposition action of the thumb now i will enumerate what all will be possible basically our hand has three types of grips first grip is actually called as the power grip through which we can hold a certain structure very firmly very tightly if you want to hold it the next one is actually called as the hook grip so where you hold the handle of a suitcase or briefcase or you want to carry a bucket 
So these two are also seen even in some of the higher primates, chimpanzees or orangutans. So that is the power grip. So what happens? All your fingers are tightly closed like a fist, but inside you can hold something. This is actually called as the hook grip. So these two are can be seen even in the higher primates as I told you. But there is one more grip which is very much unique to the humans and that is actually called as the precision grip. So the, because of this precision grip, what happens is you are holding a pencil and again can be given to chuck grip or pinch grip. So you want like pinching, you want to pinch something, you take a pinch of salt then naturally what happens you use your two fingers and roll grip. So these three grips are mainly of the precision type which is actually called as precisely you can perform certain functions. Because of that only you are able to write, draw, paint, you are able to perform musical instruments, playing musical instrument is all because of this grip and naturally it requires a lot of nerve supply and motor activity, so which I will speak again later in the forthcoming classes. So remember these basically three types of grips in our hand, one is the power grip, hook grip and what is more precise and what we are, we differ from the other higher form, from the other forms is the precision grip. Okay. So, I have told you all the unique features of the upper lip because before going in detail into the upper lip, we should know what is special about the upper lip which I have enumerated. So one thing is it does not involve in weight bearing, it is really movable to perform so many actions. Second thing is actually it is a girdle through which it is connected and mainly through the clavicle. Only because of the clavicle what happens is it is away from your axial skeleton so that you can freely move. Pronation and supination which can be performed very effectively and finally we have seen about certain grips and of that the precision grip is very very important. Okay. Now, so as I told you demand for the flexibility, so a lot of mobility and your limb should be very much flexible. So we all know if you want to just when you play basketball or football or you want to grab something which is very high and all those things. The most mobile structure in our body is actually our upper limb, mainly the shoulder joint. So to gain this or to achieve this, the bones are slender. So this also I mentioned in the first two slides itself. When you compare the proportion of the muscles and the bones of the upper limb, it is somewhat slender or more lighter than compared to the lower limb because only if you have this sleek design or slender design and not much of mass or weight reduction is there, then you can perform all the actions with agility. Not only that, the capsules are very much loose and they lack a very strong binding ligaments. Okay. So even though all these are advantageous for the flexibility, so you should always remember the dictum. Flexibility comes at the cost, mobility comes at the cost of stability. So that means what happens is because there is a great degree of mobility, they are not very strong. So more prone for dislocations. So that is what I want to stress here because when we acquire something definitely we actually tend to lose some other thing. When we gain in one aspect definitely we lose in other aspect. Okay. So you are able to see how you are able to swing your arm with so many actions, selection, abduction, flexion, extension, rotation, circumduction. So all those things we are able to perform which shows how flexible our upper limb is. So now coming to the divisions of upper limb, basically you are able to see your limb consists of everybody will be aware of this arm, forearm and hand. So arm 
and this region is actually called as the pectoral region. So between this is the shoulder where the upper lip is attached to the trunk. The shoulder region consists of even the scapula muscles. So arm is between the shoulder joint and the elbow joint. So between the two joints is actually the extension of the arm. So arm extends from the shoulder joint to the elbow joint. Your forearm is from the elbow joint and again to the wrist region where the wrist joint is present. And finally, distal to the wrist joint, what you see is the hand. So, the anterior aspect of the hand is actually called as the palm. And the posterior aspect of the hand is actually called as the dorsum of hand. Okay. So, basically, we have arm, forearm, and hand. So, this is the free upper lip. If you want to add even the shoulder part, then actually shoulder part is not free, it is actually fixed part. And ultimately we have the digits. So the five digits are here. This we call it as thumb. In anatomical terms, it is actually called as the pollux. P O L L E X. This is actually called as the pollux. This is actually called as the index finger, second digit. The digits are numbered from the thumb. So it is from lateral to medial. So I need not again stress what is lateral and medial. We have already seen all those things in the first class of the general anatomy. So this is pollux starting laterally, second index finger, middle finger, ring finger, and this is actually the little finger. So, the areas of transition where actually the different parts of limb occurs, you are able to see here, there are mainly the three areas. One is this region, your armpit is actually called as the axilla. Then another area which is the cubital fossa which is seen here, some a hollow space in front of the elbow. And here you have a tunnel, which is actually called as the carpal tunnel. Why these three areas are called as areas of transition and why they are so significant is because mainly the nerves and vessels from your thoracic or the neck region passes via this axilla into your arm. So major structures, nerves and vessels are entering into your arm via this axillary region. So that is why the axilla is very very important. Then in the elbow region what you see is the, the cubital fossa, again the important nerves and the main arterial supply is passing from your arm to the forearm in this region of elbow, the cubital fossa. And here also carpal tunnel is a very narrow area where most of not only the nerves, especially the nerves, uh, one nerve, the median nerve passes, but the tendons, the long tendons which are going to act on these fingers or digits which is going to help to move your fingers are actually passing through this carpal tunnel. So that is why these three areas, the axilla, the pivotal fossa and the carpal tunnel are considered as the important areas of transition. So which is superimposed for you. So that is the axilla, the triangular pivotal fossa and then you see a carpal tunnel. So compartments of arm, basically arm has got only two compartments. So if you look from an aerial view from above, you are able to see the arm, so shoulder and then you have the arm. Mainly the axis is formed by the bones which divides your arm into an anterior aspect and the posterior aspect. Then what happens is the nerves with the dorsal and ventral division pass in the front of the arm and behind the arm. 
So lying on that is already I told you the bones which is present, the bone is the humerus which you see here. So muscles of the posterior compartment are actually called as the extensors and the muscles of the anterior compartment are actually called as the flexors. This is not only for the arm, for the whole upper lip, front of the forearm you have flexor muscles, back of the forearm you have extensor muscles. So that is the anterior aspect of the arm, forearm and hand you are able to see that is the cubital fossa, the axilla. So the flexor muscles are present and the one major muscle we all would be aware of is the biceps muscle which mainly forms the bulk of the front of the arm. So this is the back of arm you are able to see here and here only one muscle at the posterior aspect of the arm which is the triceps muscle. So forearm again has got only two compartments the anterior or flexor compartment mainly the subject between two nerves one is the median nerve and other one is the ulnar nerve flexor compartment all the muscles are mainly flexor in their function so they are mainly responsible for the flexion of not the forearm but your hand digits wrist and so on Posteriorly, it is mainly supplied by the radial nerve. Okay, this is actually the radial nerve because it is actually colored in red. Don't mistake it for the artery. Just to differentiate three nerves, of, that is why it is actually depicted in a red color. So the anterior and posterior compartment. We are able to see groups of muscles in the anterior compartment and the posterior compartment muscles mainly the superficial anterior group of flexor muscles and here are able to see the deep group of muscles they are mainly supplied by the median nerve and by the ulnar nerve the hand we are able to see carpal bones in the wrist region then you have the metacarpal bones five metacarpals are there and then you have the phalanges so each digit has three phalanges, proximal phalanx, middle phalanx and distal phalanx. But your thumb has only proximal and distal phalanx. The joints between the phalanx is actually called as interphalangeal joints. They are actually called as interphalangeal joints. So do you remember what type of joint is an interphalangeal joint? It is a simple joint or a compound joint or complex joint, only two bones are involved, so naturally it should be a simple joint. Okay. So, hand, dorsum of the hand is the back of the hand and front of the hand is actually called as the thumb of the hand. So, thumb called as the pollux, index finger, middle finger, ring finger and this is actually the little finger from lateral to medial it is named. So first one is this one, then second, third, fourth and fifth or the smallest one is the most medial digit. So a whole lot of muscles are present in the hand. So almost nearly 20 muscles are present. I am not going to tell the names of all these muscles in this class. So we are going to see that only in the forthcoming classes. I just want to tell you intrinsic muscles which means which origin from the hand region and get inserted. They are present within that region only and intrinsic muscles they are almost 20 in number. In addition to that you have this long tendons which are also coming from the forearm. Okay. So, so many muscles are there that then only what happens we will are able to perform so many skilled movement through our fingers because of presence of these muscles and the main nerve innervating is the ulnar nerve so that is why ulnar nerve is actually called as the nerve of the hand three fourth of the muscle around 16 muscles of the 20 is actually innervated by the ulnar nerve. Major motor nerves of the upper limb, 
radial nerve, median nerve and ulnar nerve, they are the major nerves which is going to innervate most of your forearm and the hand. The upper part of arm, the axillary region, you have another two nerves, the axillary and the musculocutaneous nerve which innervates the arm. So, axillary, radial, musculocutaneous, median and ulnar nerve are the five motor nerves. Motor nerves, which means they are responsible for the innervation of all the muscles of the upper limb. So, these originate from the brachial plexus. So, brachial plexus we are going to see very shortly in one or two classes in the future. So, I am not going to discuss much about the brachial plexus now. They are from ventral primary ramai of the spinal nerves, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th and 1st thoracic spinal nerve. The ventral ramai, they form a plexus and the branches from these plexus only what we saw in the last slide as the radial nerve, median nerve, ulnar nerve, axillary nerve and musculocutaneous nerve. Apart from that, there are also other branches. So, we will see shortly regarding the brachial plexus as I told you in one or two classes. So, the major nerves, now you know it is actually from the brachial plexus. So, the brachial plexus is mainly responsible for the innervation of the upper limb. Now, coming to the sensory innervation, yes, how actually it is innervated. So, this during the development, you can see this is your trunk of the body and the small appendage grows. They are actually called as the limb buds. And limb buds, what happens? They will elongate, then constrictions will appear, thereby dividing it into a hand region, forearm, and arm region. So, what I would like to establish the fact that so from your main trunk what happens is there is a migration into the limbs the muscles and all those things connective tissue bones they are through myotomes we call it as sclerotomes so again don't worry about i am introducing some new new terms we will see all those myotomes sclerotomes again in the appropriate classes when they migrate, definitely any muscle which migrates from its origin, original location to any other location, it drags along with it its nerve supply. So, it actually retains its nerve supply at any cost. Okay. So, that is why what happens is you are able to see how the limb is innervated. This is the sensory innervation of the dermatomes of the upper lip we are seeing. How the C3, C4, C5, C6, C7, C8, T1 and T2 they form actually some arc around an axis. So, they are mostly of developmental perspective. So, the lateral part C5, C6, C7 then C8, T1 mostly on the medial side. Okay. This not only sounds good for the sensory innervation or dermatomes, even for the motor innervation, if you look at this side, it is mainly through these segments only. So, that is why I told in the beginning that as they develop, even the muscles, they migrate, they bring along with them their original nerve supply, the drag along with them. And, and that is the only evidence we can know that they have migrated. So, arranged in a superior to inferior sequence and along the central axis of the limb. Okay. So, the axis of the limb mainly it is an artery will serve as an axis during development. We will see what is the axis artery of the upper limb later. So, naturally what is in front this is actually called as the pre-axial border and this is actually called as the post-axial border. So, pre-axial border and post-axial. Pre-axial border is your radial border and post-axial border is your ulnar or medial. This is lateral and medial. And our upper limbs rotate 90 degrees laterally during development and our lower limb rotates 90 degrees medially during development. To gain its final position. So, here 
you are able to say as I told you this is pre axial see the color schema what they have given the purple color C3, C4, C5, C6 post axial in the green color so I already told you this is the pre axial border and the post axial border so they already form like an arc so lateral you can think it starts from C4, C5, C6, C7 and median C8, T1 and T2 as you go from top to the bottom that is from cranial to caudal part of the limb and again from caudal to cranial part of the limb. So there are two views which we are seeing but only with a slight difference you are able to see here but almost it is the same. So dermatomes of the upper limb I hope you will remember uh, we are not going to speak much about the dermatomes in any other class so here I have already mentioned about how the skin of the upper lip is innervated and which spinal segments are responsible for it. So some of the cutaneous nerves also you see here certain nerves supraclavicular nerves which innervate your uh, pectoral region and lateral part of your shoulder then upper lateral cutaneous nerve, lower lateral cutaneous nerve then lateral cutaneous nerve of arm, lateral cutaneous nerve of forearm and so many nerves which we are seeing here. So don't worry about suddenly so many names cropping up in this lecture uh, that is lateral cutaneous nerve, this nerve, that nerve, upper nerve, lateral nerve and all. And cutaneous nerve innervation is not very uh, essential to know or memorize all the names because usually what happens is I already mentioned in my introductory lectures in general anatomy that the dermatomes overlap so because if any area of skin is cut we don't completely lose the sensations because there is an overlapping of dermatomes that is why but certain areas where the cutaneous innervation of the dermatomes are very significant there I will stress so I have stressed certain areas in one of my classes also for the nipple and for the umbilicus what are the spinal segments involved now here you are look at it next the major arteries of the upper lip here are able to see the first artery is the from the subclavian artery it continues down as the axillary artery then the axillary artery continues in the arm as the brachial artery we all know that this artery is used for recording the blood pressure then the brachial artery divides the elbow region into the radial artery and ulnar artery we all know that radial artery is used for recording the pulse radial pulse we usually see in the wrist region then this radial and ulnar artery what happens is form some arterial arches so there is an anastomosis so again in circulatory system i have explained about what is anastomosis different types of anastomosis the two arches are there one is the superficial another one is the deep palmar arches we all, why it is present in the form of arches because we use so many grips constantly we hold something power grip, hoop grip, precision grip and all for so many activities, day to day activities for example we drive a bike for one hour so naturally when there is a lot of pressure if it is, there is going to be only one single artery what happens is then the blood supply might be interrupted so to avoid that what happens is there is always an anastomosis so that the collateral circulation is there and the blood supply is not interrupted to the digits. Okay. So that is about the arteries of the upper limb. Veins. So they are mainly present as superficial and deep veins. Superficial veins usually starts as again venous arches, dorsal venous arch at the back of the hand. See so here also you have palmar venous arches. And two veins superficial you see laterally the cephalic vein and other one medially is the basilic vein the basilic vein continues as the axillary vein cephalic vein drains into the axillary vein between the basilic vein and the cephalic vein here you have one more very important vein you know median cubital vein so this is mainly used for very puncture intravenous injections to administer drugs or for withdrawal of blood for diagnosis and all those things this median cubital vein is the most preferred vein 
fins in the arm is present in the form of brake in which you see set of rings are able to see they are actually called as vena cavitae so what is the vena cavitae adi when a pair of rings run on either side of an artery they are actually called as vena cavitae so all these terms again and again they keep on repeating so that means you should have understood the importance of the general anatomy lectures so general anatomy lectures if you are thorough then naturally the you will be able to very easily grasp the all these terms whenever i mention it okay the shoulder you are able to see here it contains the scapula and the clavicle there is a joint which is actually called as the shoulder joint so they have opened up the shoulder joint for to show him for you you will be able to visualize the head of the humerus and that is the glenoid fossa of the scapula okay. so coming to the bones of the upper limb first clavicle scapula humerus radius ulna carpals metacarpals phalanges i will repeat they are clavicle scapula humerus radius ulna carpals metacarpals and phalanges so we are going to see these bones one by one most distinguishing features only the first bone we will see is scapula you all remember what type of bone is a scapula whether it is a long bone or short bone or flat bone irregular bone or rheumatic bone so scapula is actually a flat bone you are able to see it is very much flat in nature thin it is also called as the shoulder blade two surfaces the front surface is actually called as costal surface because it is related to the ribs then you have got a dorsal surface the dorsal surface can be identified by the presence of this structure which is actually called as the spine of the scapula the spine again expands to a process which is actually called as the acromion process in the front you are able to see another process which is actually called as the coracoid process okay so a spinous process and acromion process and coracoid process are the three processes of the scapula so again will you be able to recollect coracoid process is an example of one type of epiphysis so what are the four types of epiphysis which has uh, been uh, discussed in the skeletal system you have four types of epiphysis one is actually called as atavastic epiphysis of this this is actually called as atavastic epiphysis coracoid process is a very good example of atavastic epiphysis that is an individual bone slowly during the time of evolution it comes and becomes a part of another bone so it has got three angles scapula you are able to see this is the medial angle the lateral angle which is the glenoid fossa itself and the inferior angle and you have two surfaces and three borders medial border lateral border and superior border so the ventral or the costal surface i told you it is related to the ribs and it is also has a shallow fossa which is actually called as subscapular fossa the subscapularis muscle is going to take origin from this surface the dorsal surface because of the spine is can be divided or it's divided into two compartments this is actually called as supraspinous and this is actually called as infraspinous fossa small supraspinous and large infraspinous muscle. so supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscles take origin from it so different views of scapula you are able to see here this is the dorsal view this is the ventral view where you can see the costal surface subscapular fossa this is the lateral view that is the lateral border for you and this is actually the glenoid fossa where the head of the humerus is going to articulate and form the shoulder joint this is the coracoid process and the other one is the acromion process 
So the spine starts from the medial bottom and extends laterally where it is wide to form the acromion process. I told you the spine as it crosses laterally it forms the acromion process. At the superior border lateralmost end you have the coracoid process. The superior angle lies opposite the second rib whereas the inferior angle lies opposite the seventh rib. So, the lateral angle forms the glenoid fossa. So, the lateral angle, the other name is actually the glenoid fossa. We are able to see that the scapula in situ opposite this first rib, second rib. You will have the superior angle and the inferior angle near the seventh rib. So, it is actually resting on the ribs, but definitely there is muscles in between the ribs and the bone but it does not form any joint with the ribs. The next bone, very peculiar bone, which we come across is the clavicle. So, this bone you are able to see, clavicle. I told you very peculiar bone because it is the only long bone which lies horizontal in our body. So, it lies lateral to the first rib, so naturally the first rib is under cover of this clavicle, slightly sinuous or S shape, where medial two third is convex and lateral one third, sorry, medial two third is convex and lateral one third is concave anterior, when you look at the anterior border, then you are able to see medial end is somewhat round and lateral end is somewhat flattened. So, major function, transmission of forces from the limb to the axial skeleton, so that is why it acts as a strut, it is also called as a strut. Holding the arm free from the trunk, it is also called as collar bone, it is actually called as the collar bone. So, you are able to see the Full view of the clavicle, medial end is somewhat round or cylindrical, lateral end is flat or called as the acromial end. This is sternal end where it is going to articulate with the manubrium sternum forming the sternoclavicular joint, anterior border, medial two third is convex, lateral one third is concave. This is quite opposite for the lateral border, sorry the posterior border. Posteriorly medial two third is concave, lateral one third is convex. So, this is the clavicle view from above, when you view from below, you are able to see a shallow fossa, this is actually called as the subclavian fossa. Then you are also able to see a conoid tubercle and a trapezoid line, a conoid tubercle and trapezoid line. So, based on these features, you can identify the inferior surface of the clavicle. So that you can differentiate the inferior surface from the superior surface. So one peculiarity I told you only long bone lying horizontal in the body. It is also called as dermal bone because it is pierced by one of the cutaneous nerves. So it has got two ends, sternal end articulates with the sternum from the sternoclavicular joint. Acromial end articulates the acromion process of scapula forming the acromioclavicular joint from parts of the pectoral girdle. The body is convex medially two third and concave lateral one third. So, this we have already seen. The next bone is the humerus. If you look at the humerus, a classical example of a long bone which has got a long shaft and two ends, upper end and a lower end. So, the body is actually called as a shaft and then you have the upper and the lower ends. The upper end, what you see, this is actually called as the head of the humerus and immediately lateral to the head, you see a constriction in dotted lines that is actually called as the neck of the humerus. There are two necks for the humerus. Anatomically, only this is the original neck. And we have one more neck here which differentiates the metaphysis from the epiphysis. This is actually called as the surgical neck. 
Why it is called as surgical neck of humerus is because what is most common site of fracture that is one thing. Second thing, the axillary nerve is intimately related to that neck of the humerus. So very important for the surgeons. So that is why it is actually called as the surgical neck of the humerus. We have two bulgings on the upper end. You are able to see one is laterally or more posterior, which is called as the greater tubercle. The other one, which is actually called as the lesser tubercle. The head is almost spherical, and it is going to articulate with the glenoid fossa of the scapula. But the head is two times much larger than this glenoid fossa. It does not completely go and fits inside this fossa. So, head of the humerus, greater tubercle and lesser tubercle. Separated from the head by a short constriction, which is actually called the anatomical neck. Here you have the surgical neck of the humerus. This is the dorsal surface, posterior aspect, and this is the ventral surface. Only the ventral surface will be, will be able to appreciate both the greater and the lesser tubercle. And ventral surface can easily be identified by all these features on the lower end of the humerus. Come to it. So that is the greater tubercle, more prominent than compared to the lesser tubercle, and placed more posteriorly when the arm is hanging by the side, that is at its resting position. Between the two tubercles, you see a groove, this is actually called as the intertubercular sulcus. So that is actually called as the intertubercular sulcus and the two tubercles are separated from the shaft by the surgical neck. So that is the surgical neck of humerus. This is intertubercular sulcus, other name for it is bicipital groove because the tendon of biceps passes through this groove. So that is why it is actually called as bicipital groove. Shaft has got mainly upper end of the shaft which is almost cylindrical whereas lower end is slightly flattened so that is why it is triangular in nature. Two borders are there, lateral border and medial border, that is the lateral border and medial border. If you trace this lateral and medial border, they form something called as lateral and medial supracondylar ridge and they end in lateral and medial epicondyles. Epi means upon, so it is actually called as epicondyles. Then you will come across a rough area on the lateral aspect in the upper part of the shaft, which is actually called as the deltoid tuberosity. Deltoid tuberosity you see on the shaft for the insertion of the deltoid muscle. For the insertion of the deltoid muscle. Lower end, when you look at the lower end, from median to lateral, you see the medial epicondyle. This is actually called as the trochlea. Trochlea means pulley, pulley shape, so that is what is called as trochlea. And this is actually called as the capitulum. And the depression immediately above the trochlea is actually called as the coronoid fossa. And the depression above the capitulum is actually called as the radial fossa. Medial epicondyle, trochlea, capitulum, lateral epicondyle, above the trochlea, coronoid fossa, above the capitulum, what you see is the radial fossa. Back side, you see a one more fossa which is actually called as the olicronon fossa. Okay? The medial epicondyle comparatively is much larger as to the lateral epicondyle. So here, you are able to see the posterior aspect. In the posterior aspect, you are able to see another fossa which is actually called as the olicronon fossa. Deltoid tuberosity, the upper part of the shaft laterally, you are able to see for the insertion of the deltoid muscle. Lower end, sorry, in a more magnified view, trochlea, coronoid fossa, capitulum, radial fossa. So, what articulates in the trochlea? Is that notch, the trochlear notch of the ulna? So you will have a clear view of the trochlear notch of ulna when we discuss about the ulna. 
this is actually the capitulum where the upper surface of the head of the radius is going to articulate. These three are going to form the elbow complex, elbow joint. Posteriorly, you can see to the olecranon fossa, the olecranon process of ulna is getting articulated. So, olecranon fossa fits into this olecranon or process fits into this fossa, especially during full extension. So, this is actually you are able to see in the resting position when the elbow is extended. So, we have seen about the scapula, we have seen about the clavicle, we have seen about the humerus. Now, we will be discussing about the radius. Radius is actually bone of the forearm. Humerus is the bone of the arm. Two bones are there. Laterally, what you see is the radius, and medially, what you see is the ulna. So, two bones, radius and ulna. It is also both the bones are, of course, they are examples of long bones. So, naturally, this body is actually called as a shaft and it has two ends. For the radius, the upper end is very narrow and the lower end is somewhat broad. The upper end has got a head which is disc shape, which articulates with the upper surface of the humerus and there is also a notch for the ulna. Then we have a constriction which is actually called as the neck and we also come across a fibrosity here which is the radial fibrosity. So a clear view of the radius, you are able to see here this is the whole radius for you. The upper end is actually called as the head. The upper surface of the head articulates the humerus as I told you and this circumference of the head forms the superior radio ulnar joint. So, that is why the head has got two articular surfaces. I repeat two articular surfaces, the upper surface and the circumference two surfaces. Then you are able to see this is the radial tuberosity and you also see a notch which is actually called as the radial notch. This is for the ulna bone where it is going to articulate from the superior radio ulnar joint. The constricted part immediately below the head is actually called as the neck of the radius. The lower part of the radius is somewhat expanded. So, below the neck you see the radial tuberosity. Body of the radius has got three surfaces. You have a ventral surface, you have a lateral surface and you have a posterior or dorsal surface. You have three borders. This is actually the medial border or the interosseous border. Then you have the lateral border and you also have an anterior border. So, above it articulates with the elbow and it articulates with the ulna from the superior radial ulnar joint. Below it articulates with the lower end of ulna to form the inferior radial ulnar joint. Middle also there is a connection between these two by a membrane forming the middle radial ulnar joint. The lower part of the lower end of the radius, lower surface, inferior surface takes part in the wrist joint. So that is the lower end of the radius for you. Laterally, the lower end of the radius, you see a styloid process. And medially, you see an ulnar notch for the articulation of the head of the ulna. Yes, I told head of the ulna. For the ulna, the head is at the lower end. For the radius, the head is at the the head is at the upper end. Circumference of the head of the radius, upper surface of the head of the radius, neck, radial tuberosity. So, head of the ulna for the inferior radial ulna joint, inferior surface forms or takes part in the wrist joint. So, it is articulating in two bones, carpal bones inferior surface, apart from articulating the lower part of the head of the ulna forming the inferior radio ulna joint. So, the next bone what we are going to see is the ulna bone. So, this is the ulna for you. Again, it is a long bone with a shaft and it has got two ends. The body is actually called as the shaft, the medial bone of the forearm. 
it has got an upper end and a lower end. The upper end consists of a large process which is actually called as the olecranon process. Then you have the coronoid process. Both the process together contribute for the formation of a notch which is actually called as the trochlear notch. And there is a small tuberosity which is actually called as the ulnar tuberosity below the coronoid process. Then you also have a radial notch through which the head of the radius articulates. So that is the upper end of ulna for you. One which is projecting upwards is called as the olecranon process. One which is projecting anteriorly is actually called as the coronoid process. Below that you see a small tuberosity which is called as ulnar tuberosity. Laterally, you are able to see this white shaded area that is again articular surface, radial notch for articulation of the circumference of the head of the radius. Posterior aspect of the upper end of ulna, you are able to see here, you are able to find the olecranon process. Markedly, you can see the olecranon process. So, that is the olecranon process for you. Projecting anteriorly is the coronoid process. Both of these, that is the ventral surface of the olecranon and the upper surface of coronoid together form a single articular area which is actually called as the trochlear notch which will articulate with the trochlea of the humerus. This blue color shaded one is the radial notch where the circumference of end of radius will articulate for the superior radio ulnar joint. The body is again triangular, that is the shaft is triangular, upper three-fourth is cylindrical and upper three-fourth is actually triangular and lower one-fourth is cylindrical in nature. It consists of a small head, very small rounded head articulating with the lower end of the radius and inferior surface articulating with the wrist joint. In medial it has a very short styloid process. So here you are able to see the lower head has lower end has got a small head and then a very small projection that is the styloid process. The magnified curve of the lower end of the radius laterally and that is the ulna, head of the ulna and styloid process of the ulna. This is articulation inferior radio ulnar joint and this large areas or for articulation with the wrist joint. So now coming to the bones of the hand, they mainly consist of carpal bones, metacarpal bones and phalanges. The carpal bones are eight bones arranged in two rows. The top row or the proximal row consists of scaphoid, lunate, triquetral and pisiform. The distal row consists of trapezium, trapezoid, capitate and hamate. Very interesting mnemonic to remember this. Scaphoid, lunate, triguttral, pisiform. And this is trapezium, trapezoid, capitate and hamate. You are able to see these bones. This is lateral to medial proximal row, scaphoid, lunate, triguttral, PC form. Again, you should not start from here, but again come to lateral, again from lateral to medial because this is a common mistake made by most of them. Trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and hamate. She looks too pretty, try to catch her, this is the mnemonic, she looks, she for scaphoid, looks for lunate, two for triquetral, pretty for pissy form, try for trapezium, two for trapezoid, catch for capitate and her for hamid. Scaphoid means boat shape, lunate, you all know that half moon shape, 
then trichotron pisiform is P shaped, then capitate means it has a head like process, hamate means you have a hook like shape. The metacarpals you see here they are actually 1 to 5. So, 5 metacarpals numbered from lateral to medial, first, second, third, fourth, and fifth. So, if you look at the metacarpals, the first metacarpal is the shortest and stoutest of all the metacarpals. And as I told you, each metacarpal has got a base, shaft, and a head. So, that means it has only an epiphysis at one end. So, they are examples of miniature long bones and each metacarpal makes a joint with the proximal phalanx and that is actually their metacarpophalangeal joints. Phalanx for the first digit only two proximal and distal and this is the interphalangeal joint. The other four digits there are three phalanx, proximal, middle and distal phalanx so two joints, proximal interphalangeal joint and distal interphalangeal joint. So that is for today regarding the introduction of the upper limb. Thank you very much for listening to this session.